But anyways, the beginning was that my father needed a tool. I ended up building something, but then other farmers saw this tool as well and said, Hey, they would like to start using it. And that was when it clicked that it could grow into a business. In the European Union, we have this ETS emission trading system or quotas. We have some portion of CO2 that we have agreed it is okay to emit by big corporations. And then these big companies are trading for those quotas. But if you buy a quota, then it doesn't mean that you are now carbon neutral. It only means you buy allowance to emit, but the first step and main step should be reducing emissions. Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome to Mission First, the podcast to learn from successful entrepreneurs changing the world for the better. Do you want to save time by avoiding making the same mistakes that lots of entrepreneurs have already done? Then make sure to follow this podcast because you are going to get actionable strategies coming directly from those who have found product market fit and are scaling up fast. Think about it as a masterclass about product innovation, business models, leadership, and growth marketing. I know that for you, entrepreneurs like me, your time is limited. You love to learn, but you don't always have the time to listen to the long episodes of this podcast. So I decided to create a new format. I still record a long interview to learn a lot from my guests, but we edit it and release it into a series with shorter episodes. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn or by email and let me know if you prefer that format. The Kyoto Protocol of 1997 and the Paris Agreement of 2015 came with new regulations and new challenges for companies and the economy. New challenges nearly always produce new markets, and the ongoing climate crisis and rising global emissions are no exception. In today's mini-series, my guest is Robin Salwax, CEO of eAgronome. He has brilliantly taken advantage of the situation while having a tremendous positive impact on this planet. The farmers he is helping are sequestrating more than 100,000 tons of CO2 per year. That is more or less the emissions of 58,000 cars every year that is saved thanks to its carbon program and it's growing 30% month on month. Robin with the e agronome has 72 full-time employees, less than half in Estonia. They've raised a Series A round of $7 million dollars and they are growing very, very quickly. In this first part of this mini-series with Robin, we will explain the difference between carbon credits and being carbon neutral and explore what's the role of my guest on the road to net zero. Robin, thank you very much for being here with us today. How are you? Thank you. Glad to be here. Me too. I'm really happy to welcome you today. So let's start with your mission. Can you tell us a bit more about what's your mission with eAgronome? We are bringing economic benefits to sustainable farmers. And the good news is that farmers, they would be happy to change practices to are more sustainable. But the thing is, it has to be already short-term profitable for them. All farmers know that in the long run, it's really good to apply these practices and they improve soil. You have to put less fertilizers, your plants are healthier and so on. But farmers have uh, short-term liabilities already. So they have to pay loans every year. And therefore, their practice changes have to be short-term profitable. I guess another good news is that there are a bunch of stakeholders who are happy to incentivize sustainable farmers. Like there are some companies ready to pay to farmers to sequester their CO2 emissions in the soil, meaning offsetting their emissions. Banks are already giving better terms if you go and buy electric car. They are happy to give better terms to sustainable farmers as well. Food companies, almost all of the big ones, have sustainability targets for their value chain. And landlords are happy to incentivize farmers taking good care of their soil and their land. But all of those stakeholders lack the ability to verify the emissions in the farm and to verify which farmers are sustainable and which farmers are not. So this is where we come in and this is what we do. We help to verify the emissions in the farm and by doing it, bringing those economic benefits to sustainable farmers together with our partners. On one side, with this carbon program, you have carbon credits for farmers, so they can basically get paid for improving their soils. And on the other side, you allow people to, or companies to buy carbon credits and to support sustainable farming. 
And then the third part is the global network of partners that you try to have. I grew up in the countryside, but I'm not a farmer myself. And I know that's very hard work. So can you explain us a bit with, with your carbon program, what you exactly do for the farmers? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the biggest carbon banks, so-called, let's call it carbon bank, is soil. So there is more carbon stored in the soil that there's carbon stored in the plants. So usually if you think, okay, where the carbon is, we think they're in the trees and etc. And that's true, but there's more carbon in soil. And probably many people have heard the term humus. So humus is the richest part of the soil and 40% of this is carbon. So if you're talking about creating carbon credits in farm, then we are talking about farming in a way that would increase the humus balance. So sequestering more carbon in the soil so that in the future there will be less CO2 in the atmosphere. And now we go back to this, I don't know if it's elementary school or slightly later, the biology lessons and quick reminders up from there about photosynthesis. So um, how soil is created is that there are plants growing and with photosynthesis, this is what they need for growth. They're sequestering CO2 and they are releasing O2 and they're storing C, so they're storing carbon inside the plant. And then when the plant is dying, the bacteria are kind of eating the plant and partly CO2 is released back to the atmosphere and partly this carbon is turned into the soil. Now you might ask, hey, like, isn't this what all farmers are doing already? And why should we then pay to farmers for doing it? And that's true. Now the carbon credit is something that farmers do on top of those common practices. So something they do extra to sequester even more carbon. This additionality criteria is super important in the carbon credit world, meaning that farmer didn't do the activity before, meaning also that it's not a common practice or the set of practices is not common in the region. So less than 20% of the farmers are adopting those. And then thirdly, it is also not required by law for this farmer to do those practices. So it, it has to be an additional practice that farmers are doing to sequester more carbon in the soil. So one side, for example, is to help them optimize the use of fertilizers and the fuel they're using to do these things. So are you directly advising them on that part? Or do you work with people who do that? Yeah, well, both actually. So we started with the direct sales model. So we have our own sales teams in Estonia, Latvia, Poland. That was really good to get started because it showed us what the people on the field have to go through. But now we are looking for local partners, local companies who already have the farmer network and then bringing this opportunity to farmers. And these partners have to have their own agronomists also on the payroll. And then we, we are educating their team on um, how to create carbon credits in the farm, how to improve the soil and what kind of benefits it has. Because actually in the long run, the carbon credit is only a small part of the benefits and bigger benefits are improved soil and less the savings from fuel usage and savings from fertilization usage. But in the short run, the carbon credit helps to cover the extra cost. When you talk about carbon credits, this is something that I'm pretty new on my side with. So would you mind explaining us the difference between carbon credits and carbon offsetting, for example? Because I think these terms are used very often and misused very often. Yeah. Well, one carbon credit is equal to at least one ton of additionally removed CO2 from the atmosphere. And if companies buy this credit, then they want to be sure that it is true. So then there are also some verifiers who uh, have a set of rules. They're called methodologies and you have to follow them and then they check if you actually follow those rules. And these are quite tough rules all about what is considered additional, like we discussed before. Also uh, avoiding leakage. So your activities should not do harm to any other uh, things. Like uh, let's say if all farmers in Germany would start growing trees on the fields, then that would sequester more carbon, but then someone else should grow food for German people. And uh, in some other place, some trees should be cut. So that's called leakage. So we should avoid that. To the permanence, we should make sure that the carbon is sequestered in the soil. Well, ideally for hundred years, but this is quite difficult to prove. So 30 years is more like a approach that we can take. 
And then carbon offsetting is using those credits to offset your emissions. But another thing, something that people also misunderstand in the European Union, we have this carbon emission, ETS emission trading system or quotas and quotas, they are um, allow ones to emit. So we have some portion of CO2 that we have agreed in the European Union that it, it is okay to emit by big corporations, big companies like energy, power plants, and etc. And then every year we are reducing this amount. And then these big companies are trading for those quotas. But if you buy a, a quota, then it doesn't mean that you are now carbon neutral. It only means you buy allowance to emit. At the same time, if you buy enough carbon credits to offset your emissions, then you can call yourself as carbon neutral. The important point is, and we always tell it to our credit buyers as well, the first step is to reduce emissions. And then offsets should be used for remaining emissions. But the first step and main step should be reducing emissions. That should be the first step for all of us, right? Reducing our emissions and then thinking about how we can offset what's excessive. Before this experience, you had a family agriculture business, but before you started this project, eAgronom, you also had your own company during, I think, 10 years, I read on LinkedIn, that you also exited. So you wanted to talk about how you've turned your personal problems into a business. So I'm really curious to hear what you can share from these two stories, starting first with Three Little Piglets, Science Show Company. Yeah, absolutely. So here's the thing. I was, I was in high school and obviously coming from the farming family and coming from entrepreneurial family, I was interested in business, but my focus was football. That was my dream. I wanted to start playing in Manchester United or any other of those big clubs. That was the focus. And then... In high school, all of the students in Estonia have to, uh, in the end of the high school or by the end of the high school, have to write a paper or do some research. But it was also possible to do a student company as an alternative. And we, with some other classmates, thought that, hey, building a company would be a much more fun experience. And then we started discussing and somehow the discussions went to the place that, hey, we see the children, if they are in the kindergarten, then they really want to go to school. But then when they are already in school, then they're not interested in the school anymore. And we thought how to bring this excitement back to learning and decided doing science shows so that we show some magical trick to children. And then they would ask questions from us. Why did it happen? And what's the science behind this? and uh, develop an interest in learning. And at first we started in birthdays and then later we started doing the same kind of shows in the kindergarten classes. And today there are thousands of children, six-year-old children going to class every week or every second week. And then every year, hundreds of children are inviting us to their birthdays as well. And that's really exciting because we see, well, birthday is the most important day of a year for the children. And now they are inviting us to teach them something during this day. So we have made studying and science quite exciting for them. And for me, it showed the beauty of building a business. And for me, the beauty was that if, if you saw some kind of problem in a world, you see that you want to fix something, then there are many ways to fix it. But one of the ways that I personally like a lot is building a business around this problem or around this challenge. In a nutshell, what was the business model of this one and how big was the company when you sold it and when you left it? Well, initially with the science shows during birthdays, uh, people were paying us, but then we hired a lot of uh, students. We actually sold the company, I could tell about this as well, but we have probably still have around 50 people, students doing those science shows. So it's really cool to give it the first work experience as well and something to write to their CVs and uh, take the first steps in the job market. And then we had parents, instead of inviting a clown or some other performer to the birthday party, they invited us to do this science show. And then with those kindergarten classes, we have the monthly recurring fee, something that they paid. And then later years, and that's still going on, we started doing like a science boxes. So something that children can do in the home on their own. 
And that was really nice because um, that didn't involve that much labor from our end anymore. And it was much more scalable. Uh, and the company who bought this, obviously, it wasn't a, like a big exit or anything, but still uh, nice to see that the company is still up and running. The company who bought this is doing one science television show in Estonia. And it's really nice to see them taking this project forward now. That's really cool. Congratulations for starting a company so young and making it to the stage of selling it. I really love that idea because I studied science and chemistry and I run into a similar problem on my side too. During my PhD, you get a grant in order to study, you do your research and in exchange you have to do a certain amount of hours, teach a certain amount of hours to the students of the university or in that case for myself, I was involved into an exhibition that we were doing once a year, doing a month and welcoming twice a day a full amphitheater full of students, you know, 16, 17, just before they were going to the university. And it was called a science exhibition. And what we realized is we were teaching them in a very boring way. The old fashioned way of doing this, which was, okay, we mix these two components. Here is what happens. Here is the science behind it. Of course, a few would be super amazed and focused, but most of them would just drop. And so what we decided to do one time, we had an evening and we brainstormed, what could we do? At the time, there was this TV show, it's French, it's called The Experts, this TV show about the police department analyzing and then trying to solve murders and then using all the science behind it. And so we decided to say, okay, yeah, let's see if we can make a, a story about this. And then we turned all the experiments we wanted to have and brought them into a scenario, a storyboard, where we're starting where we were actually the policemen from this lab division and that we were noticing murders and were caught and students like were super amazed by it and the teachers told us wow this is so cool like normally we have a hard time trying to keep the students you know not screaming or just talking the whole time and now they are super entertained going back to your personal experience can you explain us a bit how your personal experience and your personal problems helped you to develop the agronom yeah so there i was finished the high school, went to study computer science. Football was long forgotten, but I had this new love business because I knew that it's a good way to change things however you want. And well, that was one of the main reasons why I uh, actually sold the company to the next guys as well, because you couldn't focus on that anymore. I went to university and others, other guys went to study abroad and etc. So, so there I was studying computer science and as you mentioned, I'm coming from the farming family. So my father has 1,400 hectare organic grain farm in South Estonia. He had, I think, 10 Excel tables to manage the farm, like financial plan and then the crop plan and the task plan and then some reports for the governments and, and etc. And he was really looking for a tool, one tool that would help to remove all this need for Excel tables and that would be used to manage the farm. And I had to look into this. We didn't find anything good. And then uh, I ended up building something on my own for my father. I actually had slightly other ideas in my mind what to do, like what kind of businesses to build in the future. But then other farmers saw this tool as well and said, hey, they would like to start using it. So that's when it clicked. And that's when I started to look for a team because I was still like a first year computer science student. So I got some guys who were really experienced programmers already. And we started some other people as well. And we started e all together. And that was in 2016. From the first prototype, we had the humus balance calculator or the soil calculator involved. Not because of farmers wanted it, but it, because it was close to our hearts. And then a few years ago or something like this, we launched the carbon program and really found a way how to work on our mission as well in helping farmers to become more sustainable. But anyways, the beginning was that my father needed a tool. I ended up building something. Other farmers needed this as well. And that was when it clicked that it could grow into a business. So that brings me to the second question you've sent me some advice about. When it comes to how to offer a new, you know, attractive business model to the farming industry, because now you take your personal problems, you develop that tool for your father, your farm. And then other farmers got interested, but then you told me you also faced two challenges at the time. So what were these challenges and how did you manage to successfully develop a new attractive business model for that farming industry? Yeah, absolutely. 
well, when you take this approach of solving some uh, problem for for you and and uh, for yourself, and then uh, assuming that others have similar problems and you see that they really have, that doesn't necessarily mean that your first business model is the correct one. We saw two big challenges. One was that uh, it's quite difficult to get farmers to to pay for any any kind of software. They're not used to, used to it. Excel is for free. And, uh, well, many of them were not using softwares at all. So, uh, basically it, it, it was possible to convince them, but it required door to door sales and basically the revenue that we got, uh, per farmer was not that high. So the unique economics were really on the edge. It was quite difficult to scale it quickly. It, it was okay, but, uh, it was difficult still to scale it super rapidly. And then with carbon program. The good thing was that we don't need to ask farmers to pay us anything anymore, but we can bring them the value and we can take cut from the value that we bring. So uh, carbon program is for free for farmers. They join the carbon program and we take our cut a certain percentage of the credits to us annually that farmers are creating. And in that way, uh, first of all, we remove the entry barrier. So uh, farmers don't need to pay for the software, but secondly, the revenue per customer is four to six times higher than it was for the software. And well, that's why when we, when we started to look for a way to move beyond software or to leverage the software that we have, but find different kind of business model then the carbon credit business was the one we chose. And obviously it, it was really close to our heart as well, because now the main KPI in the company is how much, uh, how, how much carbon have we sequestered in the soil? And because it's, uh, as I said, we get, we get to turn those into credits and we get certain percentage to ourselves. It's, uh, really connected to our financial metrics as well. What was the trigger to switch to this carbon credit and develop this carbon program? Because you started e-agronom in 2016. So you went through the different steps you described now. Were you already knowledgeable into carbon credits? Were you already looking at it and then it came like a natural step? Or how did you get informed about that? How did you come up with that idea that, okay, now, you know, that's a great way to move forward? In 2016, we knew that we had to, and we wanted to go beyond software or to monetize the data somehow better, either by building it into a marketplace as well, uh, like to bring inputs or to trade grain, uh, but somehow you, you basically go beyond this software only. That's what we understood uh, at that time. Secondly, we, we understood that soil is very important. And thirdly, we thought that there might be in the future, some kind of carbon, uh, program kind of, uh, thing, but it, it wasn't really on the horizon because the price for credit was too low, uh, for unit economics to really, for farmers and for us to play up stroll forward uh, to 2020 and the company actually has been growing quite well. So we have been growing uh, our revenues two times a year and, and that's, that's fine. It's not like a uh, disaster, but uh, we still wanted to go a step further. So then we were in 2020 and that was a point when we thought, okay, now we have to do the step forward. So what will be the next thing beyond, um, beyond software only? And, uh, several things happened at the same time. One, we, uh, we saw that in United States, there was a company called Indigo Ag starting a uh, kind of a similar kind of carbon program. Okay. There are some guys doing, uh, this not in Europe, but they are, there are some guys doing it in the same vertical in, in the farm industry, in, in farming industry, but, but in North America. Then secondly, Iagnon is part of something that we call Green Tiger in Estonia. So it's a, a group of companies that are helping to move Estonian economy uh, to become greener and more sustainable. Like Iagnon is uh, probably the smallest company over there. Other companies are like big banks and, uh, and uh, the gas station companies and etc. And there are some companies started saying that, Hey, they would be, they, they're looking for carbon credits and, uh, to, to offset their emissions. And they uh, have promised to their customers that they're going to be carbon neutral and et cetera. And then the third thing, okay, that got, got us quite interested. 
we started looking into the prices and saw that uh, the prices are high enough that it could be already profitable for farmers as well. And we started researching it and really preparing for it. And then one guy also joined us who was working in one big uh, agri agrochemical company, head of the sustainability department over there. And he was looking exactly for a project like this to do. And he approached us and we, we had same thoughts and then that kind of accelerated things as well. So all of those things came together at the end, like, uh, well, quite quickly with half a year, it was clear for us that, uh, this is the focus and this is the way to, uh, monetize the software much better compared uh, just asking farmers to pay for it. And at the same time, we bring more value to farmers, uh, and, uh, we are getting more value to ourselves as well. So timing and also being aware and looking around what the competition was doing. Yeah. You developed this new attractive business model to the farming industry. And now if you want to talk about how to bring the carbon credits in the agriculture sector, you told me that there are lots of small details that have to you know, come together. Can you explain me a bit more about this? Yeah, absolutely. A uh, few things over, over there. First of all, we are dealing with nature. Nature is super, super complex and uh, soil especially. It's much easier to understand how much carbon there is in the tree than to understand how much carbon it is in the soil. So the nature that we're working with is super complex. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, soil carbon programs are relatively new and especially in Europe and, uh, but, but also, also elsewhere, so new industry that the, the industry itself is developing. And thirdly, in the European Union, the legislative system is also, uh, just emerging. It's really good that it is, it will uh, help to avoid the greenwashing, but it's not clear exactly how, how it will turn out. So we have a super complex system that is just developing. And then we have the legislative system that is also just developing. And there are so many. Uh, small pieces, small details that we have to consider to, to make sure that we are not doing greenwashing. And then on the other side, we have farmers for whom it should be very simple, uh, and easy to join the program, uh, to understand what it is all about, to generate those credits. So they should be able only to focus on the practice chains and not to worry about anything else. So we have this kind of a trade off where we don't want to trade off actually from one side, uh, following all the rules and details and et cetera, to really make those credits real and uh, to make sure that we are not doing greenwashing. And then on the other hand, to, to make it simple for farmer so they can, uh, they, it will be attractive for them and uh, they understand this and they want to, uh, join us rapidly and in scale. Now, well, basically a few things that, uh, that, that we have learned on this process, first of all, obviously we don't know how it will all end up, but what is our approach? First of all, on the credit and certification side, we are taking the highest possible standard, considering that it will later, it will be later to easier to lower our standards than to increase. So we understand that we have to predict the market. We have to predict what the regulations are going to be and et cetera. And, uh, because. Otherwise, like if you would go to farmers right now and say that it might be this or it might be that, then it will be too confusing. We have to be clear to farmers. So we have to predict the market and over there, we are choosing to follow the highest possible standards. And then on the other hand, we have to bring this clarity to our people as well. And we have built something that we call carbon Bible. So this is the internal source of truth, uh, about everything what's going on in the car, in, in our carbon program. And if there is something missing from there, then people can ask and we will write it over there so that, well, we have 70 plus people working in the company so that any one of them, if needed and if relevant, can open this and check, check the answer. What's the current state, what's the current point of view to, to bring the clarity because, uh, farmers, sales guys, developers, they all need the certainty, even though on the leadership level, we know that some things may uh, change in the future. So is that a centralized FAQ for all the different stakeholders of your company that you keep on filling in with all the inputs you have? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm curious, how do you 
prioritize everything you can potentially develop. Because on one side, you know, you have the farmer needs, you have the legislation parts, the partners. You could go into thousands of different directions every month in what you, you want to develop. So I'm curious here, can you share a bit about what's your prioritization process in your product development? Yeah, that's uh, super difficult. Totally agree. There are more things that we can do uh, than we are able to do. We have the culture, farmer first culture in the company. So we always try to put farmer interest in the first place. And that's, that's also tricky because, uh, uh, obviously farmer asks for feature that is not aligned with our strategy currently, then, uh, well, it might, some people may feel that, uh, if you don't develop this feature right away, then it's, uh, not farmer first. Uh, also on the other hand, we have the clear mindset that we don't want to do greenwashing. And again, there, sometimes there is conflict, like for farmer, it's easier and simpler to, uh, to basically go under the bar. But if we want to avoid greenwashing, then, uh, we have to have some tougher rules and make it more difficult for farmers actually to create those credits. So over there, uh, I guess it's a lot of discussions where we just have set uh, principles, uh, like, okay, we want to do best for farmers, but we will never do greenwashing. And then on the product strategy side, doing decisions that hurt, uh, we have many customers who are also using us as a farm management software, not only as a carbon software, but the focus today is carbon. So even though, uh, we could do more like a financial planning and something financial management, something that farmers are asking for, uh, we are saying no to these things and focusing only on the, on the carbon credit side and the same, same thing with regional focus, even more difficult actually. And th this is something that weekly I have to remind to myself and then to other people as well, that when there is a really good contact coming from, uh, I don't know, North America or South America or Asia, then, uh, we have to say no to those today because we have to focus on the existing business in Europe and Africa. I'm very glad to hear that because I think learning to say no, is one of the hardest things to do, especially as a CEO, which you, you basically like, everybody's asking you about everything all the time. So, uh, yeah, congratulations for that part. And thank you for, for sharing this, this part of the process. So after we just talked about how, you know, you brought the carbon credits in the agriculture sector, I'd like to focus the next part on how you grew this company from 10 to 70 people. So we could focus on, you know, the early, very early stage. What is very interesting about your company is that you are the last co-founder that is still there. And uh, you also had a very interesting story about a, a co-founder that joined later, which was from a very impressive company that you're probably going to explain to. And so let's focus on this side. How did you grow from 10 to 70 people? What were the biggest challenges? Can you explain us a bit more about this? Yeah, absolutely. So from those first 10 people, uh, I think there is me left and uh, two other people in the company right now, two engineers. Uh, and yeah, then the first co-founder. Uh, he actually left quite recently and that's fine. We are still friends, but building, uh, like being, building a company that is like 10 people is quite different from organization that has close to hundred people already. When you hire new people, then, uh, uh the recruitment process, uh, very important and how to attract the talent, et cetera. But the biggest, like interesting learning for me was that first of all, uh, people who join you in the beginning are quite different from the people who you need in the future. And that might be from cultural best perspective, but also from the, uh, experience perspective. So in the beginning, you need, uh, hackers, basically people who hack things together and move fast and, uh, uh, try out all possible ways quickly, uh, maybe, uh, saying first and then thinking and, or doing first and then thinking and, and etc. And then another thing is the, that, um, in the beginning people, uh, and that's actually positive and good. People expect to know everything that's going on in the company and they're used to it. 
and that's totally fine. We have very transparent company, all the financial metrics are uh, available and etc. But when company grows to, let's say 70 people, then naturally uh, there are, uh, even those early people don't uh, know all the things that are going on in the company anymore. And uh, sometimes when uh, some things uh, are surprises for them, uh, and they may have some uh, tough feelings uh, because that's not how it used to be. Um, and and uh, there might be a feeling that it's becoming already a corporation and etc. Even though then when there are some co people coming uh, in later, then for them the transparency level is actually huge. So that's, that's the biggest, um, uh, like a, maybe not the learning, uh, because I think there is, nothing to do but to understand that that's fine uh, if there are different people for different uh, times but that was a big surprise I guess for me something I didn't think about I thought okay with these guys we will uh, go forever and then the other other part uh, we had a new co-founder who joined us later Christian Luha uh, he brilliant guy he was 20 years in Nike at the famous US sports company Head of Nike Russia, head of Nike Greece, head of Nike Football Marketplace. It's in relation to your, your passion too. Exactly. And I think that's how we really matched. So we met uh, accidentally in Costa Rica. We played uh, volleyball over there and we became friends. We chatted and, uh, and so on. And his wife actually has told me that uh, from the moment he saw me uh, chatting to his husband under the tree in the shadow about football, he know that something bad might come out of it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> meaning that, uh, that they, uh, he might, might, uh, join this crazy, uh, startup and he actually, uh, left Nike, uh, quite soon and, uh, well, less than a year later from the first meeting, he actually joined, uh, e -Economy. and that has been really nice, uh, to have him, uh, on board. And actually most of them are the best hires have been those kind of unofficial, uh, similar stories with, uh, CFO, uh, who met with our, uh, team in, uh, startup party in, uh, our hometown. And it was also not official, but, uh, uh discussions started moving from there that, uh, he's also looking around and uh, he had been, um, CFO of one of the. Uh, I guess one of the biggest startups in Estonia called Skeleton, one of the most successful startups. And after that went to F10, which is a 1.4 billion real estate fund. And he was head of investor relationships there. And he was, uh, well, actually looking to go back to the startup, uh, field and, uh, we approached him kind of in a, in the right moment. Uh, but I think it would have been impossible to hire him through regular recruitment uh, channel, like just posting an ad somewhere and uh, getting him interested and in applying for the job and so on. We have, we have some brilliant people who joined us that way as well. Uh, but uh, many of the best recruits uh, have came through unofficial channels. And uh, there has to be this click as well. Uh, if best, best hires are the ones who are really, really inspired about the mission, uh, and what, what you're doing. So if there is no click, then there is no point in, uh, pushing it. Yes. And starting with a mission, then it's also very, very important. One question I have regarding, you mentioned that Christian Luha, the person who joined from Nike, he's a co-founder is the CFO a co-founder too. The third question being, how do you manage to attract these people? To attract someone who's been working for years for a big corporate company like Nike. Of course, there is like the mission can be very strong and th there can be exceptions. They are so motivated by that that they, they want to put aside, you know, any like, like all the money side. Uh, but I can imagine as well that because you are a startup, you can offer shares. This is a point for some people to, to join that you can make them co-founder in that case and not only like recruiting them as employees well i think they're both they're both partners certainly and uh and indirect the cfo is uh certainly a really close um, uh, partner as well but i think the biggest uh driver be behind both of them joining uh are a few things so uh, first of all they were both in really good companies before but uh, i think they are 
both enjoying right now this hands-on approach and seeing things moving. Uh, if you are in, like, I don't know how many, but I assume tens of thousands or even 100,000 plus people working in Nike. Uh, when you're working in a HQ, then most likely when you do some decisions or you push something, then things start moving two years later. So that's, that's how you see your results. Uh, you don't have this direct impact uh, uh, with customers and the uh, relationships with customers, especially if you're in the HQ. Uh, so both of them, uh, it seems that they're enjoying this uh, opportunity to really build something and move things forward and see the results. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of beauties in, in their like, current companies and like having being part of this big corporation. But, uh, but that's the thing I told before as well. For different people, I think different times, you have to find the right time as well. So the mission has to click, but then the timing has to click as well. Uh, and then the other thing, I, I, another thing that um, about attracting, most people don't ask them. Some, some, some people, uh, I think even Chris, some, some people ask from Chris and this, that, Hey, how, from all the companies in Estonia, why did you choose here for long? And like, he didn't have any, like, uh, he developed a relationship with me and, uh, I offered him like, there was no one else uh, approaching as well. And obviously, uh, other companies, uh. Uh, well, at that point, we already had the personal relationship and he ha he liked our, our company, but I think there are many people, uh, with his experience around the world who would be ready to exper experiment, uh, and go into startup, uh, and try it out. But, uh, no one has approached them with this idea because they think, uh, it's, it's impossible. And for those, uh, people like for Nike or any other big corporation, then big having this kind of a thing in a, they have nothing to lose. Uh, let's say they would, uh, be two or three years in a startup. Uh, if things go well, they can continue and, uh, and build a longer variant over there and, uh, everything goes fine. And, uh, even financially they're doing, uh, probably even better than they would do in the big corporation. And if, uh, but if they want, they can also take two or three or even one year period. Uh, and they will, uh, get a lot of experience, different experience, something they can bring then, uh, to their next big corporations, because they're for sure, they are, uh, expected back over there as well. And, uh, waited back over there as well. Daring to ask is probably the, the bottom line here. I agree with you. That's probably lots of people are, don't dare to ask other potential talent for to join the company because you just see them at so big companies. Thank you very much for, for that advice, uh, Robin. Could you tell me what was the biggest challenge for you in all these years with eAgronom? You know, if you take into account not only growing your team, but what you describe about, you know, finding a business model and, you know, starting, kicking off that company. What do you think, what do you recon is that was your biggest challenge so far? I think the one you mentioned as well, keeping the focus and deciding, uh, what is the thing to focus on? Because especially if company go grows, you have, uh, more and more things that you can do. Uh, you have more resources as well. And it seems that you can manage it all. Uh, but actually you can't, it's, it makes sense to perfect, uh, to, to make, to decide on your focus and, uh, come perfect on that. And then when company is uh, very big, then you can start adding new, I don't know, verticals or new markets, but, uh, keeping the focus and deciding what the focus is, has been the most difficult. Coming to the last questions, what is the best advice you've been given as an entrepreneur? I think it's, a, it's actually even maybe a famous quote, I don't know who said, uh, this first, but, uh, I heard it from, uh, one of the investors. Uh, said that uh, opportunities multiply when they're seized. So uh, when you use the opportunity, then they actually multiply. And this is what we have seen as well. You don't need to uh, have, the, have everything figured out. Uh, and uh, let's see, there is an opportunity and you see this in front of you, but you see a lot of challenges as well, and you don't know how to overcome them. Once you start figuring out 
then there is high likelihood that you find your way, you learn something new uh, from there. And uh, related to this, something that we have noticed also is that uh, nothing is never as good or as bad as it first seems. Uh, almost daily, uh, or at least weekly, we get some kind of news like yeah, that uh, says that our, well, some really big problem is, or some, there's some really big problem. And then, uh, always we see that, okay, there was a calculation error or, or there is another thing to consider and vice versa as well. Almost weekly, we see huge opportunities that should become, uh, like that, that could be, uh, grow our revenues, uh, 10x in a year or something like this. But then obviously if you go start looking deeper, then you see, um, some of the challenges as well. But I, I think in general, uh, uh, it's fine if you don't know, uh, if you don't have everything figured out, uh, in the beginning, you will find your way. Let me dig a bit deeper into that part, because this is at the same time, this is very good, but it's contradictory to what you explained before as well. The showing how difficult your life is every day. How do you know when it's an opportunity you should take and, you know, figure it out on the way? And how do you know this is actually something you shouldn't be focusing at the moment? What's your decision process like to be able to differentiate between an opportunity you can start or explore and an opportunity you should, you know, wait? Yeah. Well, it's aligned with our strategy and, uh, and I guess our values as well. Uh, I mean, like strategy wise, uh, uh, does it contribute to the core markets we're focusing and the core business that we're focusing the current credits, uh, and, uh, and then obviously, uh, what are the alternatives? So, uh, and I think in the end, so that's, it's quite, it's uh, doable right now to say that, uh, to say no to things that are in North America, let's say, or to say no to, uh, some things that are not related to carbon, but then even inside this, uh, you have like different opportunities. And, uh, then there's the question, what's the opportunity cost? So what won't be done? Uh, and I think this is more of a, we don't have formula over there. It's discussion and, uh, decision, but it's a, at the same time, I think there are several ways to the same place or to the same success. So, uh, in most cases, it probably even wouldn't matter which way you go, but it more, it matters more. Uh, the execution matters more, how well you actually execute on the opportunity. Yeah. So sh you shouldn't be overthinking too much, but you, you've already explained it. As you said, you, you have no formula, but it's still very clear in your mind from what you're explaining. And thanks for sharing that. You know, you have the three key questions that you ask yourself every time. Which book would you recommend entrepreneurs like you to read? Yeah, there are many books and in general, uh, also not for entrepreneurs, but I recommend, uh, uh, reading and learning something that you enjoy, uh, and like, and like, because you never know, uh, which things will be helpful for you in the future. Uh, so if you don't know which things will be helpful in the future, and it's likely that almost everything that you learn uh, is helpful, then it makes sense to use the time while doing things that you enjoy, because then that's the way how you can actually become good at it. Because if you enjoy it, you will most likely do it more than others and you will become good. So that would be the general advice, but, uh, just taking there's, I, I'm a big reader, but just taking, uh, uh, ran, uh, one of the books that I have on the shelf, uh, I have a several, one of those, uh, it's in four obsessions of an extraordinary executive and, uh. I have many of the, uh, these books, these are something that they give to, uh, uh, people in EIFRNOM and then other entrepreneurs who I meet and uh, who I feel like, okay, they, they need that kind of a book. But the, one of the main points over here is that, uh, for companies to be successful, they have to be healthy and they have to be smart. Smart is the strategy part and the uh, sales strategies and, uh, uh and, uh, product uh, development, etc., and healthy is how they operate the culture, the recruitment processes, the people ev evaluation processes and so on. And, uh, the idea is that most companies focus more on being smart. 
So the strategies and so on are too little on being healthy. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's something that, uh, this book explains quite well what it means to build a healthy company. And, uh, uh, it's also a good reading, especially for those who, who like stories because it is written as a, as a story of, uh, of, uh, two companies. Uh, that are not real, but, uh, that have many, uh, characters of a real company. From who is it? It's, uh, Patrick Lezioni. And, um, when you think about not books, but podcasts or, you know, blogs or influencers, which one would you recommend to follow? Maybe to answer it differently than uh, it's not the podcast, but, uh, but I'm using Audible uh, a lot. And over there, the book that I'm reading right now, and I think, well, it's, it's a book that um, I think most startup uh, builders wouldn't read or listen. Uh, the book, this book is called uh, Creating It Out. And uh, it's about um, uh, building uh, McDonald's. So uh, Ray, Ray Kroc himself, wrote the book, so the founder of, uh, McDonald's and, uh, it's, um, it's a really nice, uh, read and uh, a lot of, because many, many of, I think the many opportunities in the startup field right now rely not on, uh, not on, uh, really pure technology businesses, but some business sectors that, uh, uh, could be reinvented via technology. So let's say the transportation sector, it's, uh, the Uber or Bolt in Estonia, uh, they have, uh, uh, they're using technology to make this taxi business or the commuting business more efficient. And, uh, I think for, to get some learnings about building companies like this, then McDonald's is a, uh, quite good case study. This is a, a very, very good point that Witzel van der Werf also brought in the episodes, I think, 20-something from Mission First, just looking right now, where he actually, where is it, Witzel van der Werf, episode 22, uh, about how to build an enterprise with a social and environmental impact. And he also explained very, very well how, by observing well, one of the most impactful projects in history coming from President Roosevelt in the United States, how he mobilized all the troops to plant trees at the time, like resulted in a super big environmental impact. And it, that was his idea in a completely different vertical uh, and a completely different time, looking at that, how he got the idea of let's do the same thing, like mobilize people to join the maritime industry and to create a service uh, a maritime service in that case called Sea Ranger Service with the same mission of you know trying to have a positive impact on the world. I think that's a characteristic from a lot of entrepreneurs I see is that you could argue that you know you are definitely having a positive impact on the world and that you should be focusing on you shouldn't care about McDonald's but actually by studying successful people around ourselves even though you could argue about you know some positive impact on McDonald's on the world but in the recipe for success there are some ingredients you can take and use absolutely i can i can give an example right away even with mcdonald's uh and you're true like in general uh and i'm also not sure about mcdonald's is uh, positive impact on the world but uh, they have uh, in the menu they have uh, salad and uh, because this is because they have the salad, the menu, they can easily say that uh, uh, today at least they can easily say that uh, hey, uh, uh, like we are not the uh, it's people's free choice if they take burger or they take salad. So we are doing golf. All that we are doing is very good, and that's fine. And then uh, when we thought, okay, how to get the first banks on board? for green loans, then we figured out that today, uh, the green loan can also be like a salad in banks, uh, portfolio. So that might be the first step. And I'm sure that the other steps will follow and that one point, uh, green loan will be considered as a regular loan. 
But just to get started, then we changed our approach. So instead of trying to convince uh, banks that, hey, green loan is the future and uh, your whole portfolio will be green loan, we decided to explain them that, hey, you want to have the salad in your menu. Otherwise, you will get scrutinized. Uh, and if you have the salad in the menu, then it's easier for you to switch later uh, if stronger regulations come in. So uh, there are there are learnings, um, uh, certainly. On, like, but in general, I think that's, again, the point that you should listen and read whatever interests you because then you can find those connections because you're reading or listening uh, with your full focus. Last question. Can you tell us one thing about you that I wouldn't be able to find out online? Good question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite challenging these days uh, because every, almost everything is uh, online uh, and I'm not sure if it's publicly available online, but uh, just this summer I actually got married. I guess that's... Um, a uh, good thing to have in life as well. Uh, I guess partner in crime, someone who is uh, pushing you forward. And uh, like in, in my case, my wife, Kelly, uh, she's from another industry. So she's a medical uh, doctor. But uh, uh, the one thing that is common is that we are both um, love to sports. Even though me being really busy with the business, I that's something where I went to the slippery road and I didn't exercise that much anymore until meeting her and uh, uh, it has been, well, time together with her has been quite uh, intense on the physical side as well, like running every morning and going to gym in the evening. But it's it's really good to um, uh, have a, a partner with whom you can share those moments, um, uh, maybe also that are not connected uh, to building a business. I completely agree. And so congratulations again for the wedding. And thank you again for today. Do you have any ask you would like to ask our audience? Uh, are you recruiting? Are you looking for investors? Well, both are, I, I guess in general, if, uh, if people see that it makes sense to uh, get in contact with me, then feel free to write robin at efnam.com. And uh, we are always recruiting, uh, always uh, fundraising. We are, we are targeting the Series B uh, in the next spring around 20 million euros and uh, uh, also with uh, farmers and relevant companies uh, who want to work with us in Europe and Africa and happy to be connected. Great. So I hope some people will listen and reach out to you. I'm sure they will be inspired by your mission. Thank you again so much for sharing your experience today. I hope that green loans will you know, become the inevitable burger <laughs> on the menu of all banks and companies and uh, wish you to keep on having a, a positive impact for all of the farmers and the planet. And have a great day, Robin, and hopefully meet you soon someday maybe in Berlin. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. If you like this episode, you can share it with your friends because sharing is caring and you can give it a five-star Apple podcast because this really helps to make it more visible to other entrepreneurs working on a better future like you. If you are busy and might not have the time to listen to all episodes of this podcast, just a little tip. Sign up for my newsletter on gtimpact.com. You will receive the summary of advice from each episode and you will get personal recommendations on which episode you should focus on depending on your current challenges, your industry and your startup stage. Thank you very much and see you next week for the next episode. Have a nice day. <laughs>